Thank you. Now we have Martz Hart, who will be talking up next. Thanks, Martz. All right, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. Um, this is by far the most well-organized workshop I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> certainly much better than the ones I've organized. Um, so I want to talk about biases beyond observation. And the starting point for my talk is the insight that um, really most fairness criteria that people have discussed in recent years are uh, what I call observational. Um, and what is an example of an observational criterion? It's something like um, the fraction of accepted men should be equal to the fraction of accepted women. Okay, So the rate of acceptance by some classifier should be the same in, in these two groups. Okay, That's observational which means you can write it down as a probability that involves only like the sensitive attribute and the predictor and some other stuff. And really this is uh, most of the things we discuss. Uh, for example, the compass debate that was ongoing last year and is still going on to some extent. Uh, everything that was set there is essentially an observational property, okay? Things like false positive rates by different groups, things like precision, uh, recall, um, accuracy, if you look at all these classification measures by group or whatever you want, that's an observational criterion because you can write it as a probability involving all these different things. Okay? Um, so really most of what we've discussed in fairness to, to this day is observational. Okay? So you can put that in a nice definition, uh, which is just an observational criterion is a property of the joint distribution of the features in your classification setting, the predictor, and the outcome. So really anything you can write down as a probability. So you might say, well, geez, isn't that everything? And so let me tell you why it's not and why it's actually missing important things. So uh, the issue with observational is that it's completely passive. Okay, so it's completely passive inference from what we observe and the way the world is right now at this point in time and the observations we can make about the existing world. But there, there is no form of intervention in this kind of analysis. There is no what if consideration. What if I change this? What would happen? You know, how would we change the world based on these interventions? It's purely passive. And that's why it's such a limited approach. And so with my collaborators, um, Eric, Eric Price and Nati Srebro, we turned this into sort of a theorem by constructing two different worlds, two different scenarios, um, which map to the same joint distribution over features, outcome, and predictor, but have completely different uh, interpretations for fairness. Okay, so they're completely different worlds from the perspective of fairness and how we should reason about these worlds, but they map to identical joint distributions. And that's one way of showing that no observational criterion in the world is going to tell them apart. No matter how sophisticated your, your probability statement that you're going to make, it's not going to tell these two worlds apart. Okay? It's just not powerful enough. And what's even more troubling um, is the following simple thing we show. It's that observational criteria can't even tell you if you should be happy with uh, the optimal predictor. So if you're in a setting and you ask, well, you know, is optimal prediction fine? Would we be happy with a perfectly accurate uh, uh, predictor in this setting? Observational criteria can't even tell you if that, the answer is yes or not, or yes or no. Because in the two worlds we construct, in one case the perfect predictor is something most people would be fine with, and in the other case it's not. Okay? So we're not the first to stumble into this issue of observational criteria. People have you know, struggled with this for a long time. And it is what motivated uh, you know, causal reasoning. And J.D.I. Pearl's book, for example, on causal reasoning is all about how do you go beyond observational criteria. Okay, so people have studied this in other contexts. What's tricky in fairness is that we can't just design a randomized trial based on you know, race or, or gender. That's not feasible. So we need to uh, instead understand the data and the generating process of the data and make reliable assumptions about how the data was created and generated. Okay. And if we have those assumptions, then we can start to go beyond the limits of observational and we can you know, have more meaningful criteria. Um, but of course, that's a delicate approach. And we started working that out a little bit in a recent paper with folks from uh, the Max Planck Institute uh, in Tübingen. But there's much to be done here, and it's, it's, it's not easy. But at the very least, one thing that I advocate for the community as a step forward is, let's stop to you know, try to resolve which fairness criterion everybody should use, the sort of one definition that we should all agree to. And let's instead understand the mechanical or the, 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 me the mechanisms behind the, the data and how it's generated. Let's understand how the data was produced from the point of 
you know, measurement, collection, uh, to sampling, you know? How did we get to the data that we're looking at? And if we understand the mechanisms behind the data generating process, we can start to make progress. Thanks. Thank you so much, Moritz, for that, I think, really important provocation for the day.